Good. And Thiago, how are you? Thiago! Okay, hopefully his mic will start working. Um, hi, everybody who's outside in the waiting room. Um, so, um, we're supposed to be starting Film and Lit today, but because I got sick, um, we're postponing that. Um, plus, I changed what we're going to do with Film and Lit. So, we're going to do short stories. And um, I picked something that I actually studied in college that made a big impact on me. It uh, is a collection of short stories called Winesburg, Ohio. Winesburg, Ohio. So, and um, Federico, I'm going to mute you for just a second because it sounds like you've got some uh, some background music or music background noise coming through. So, um, but no worries. Just when you want to talk, just um, unmute yourself. So, we're going to be looking at Winesburg, Ohio. Uh, for the next four sessions that are supposed to be film and lit. And I'm really excited about it, actually. I hope that you guys enjoy it. And as you can see, I have a definition on the board, and this definition will actually become a big part of, um, of what we'll be reading. So um, before I get into all that, let me just quickly introduce myself and have everybody introduce themselves. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Shanae, and I'm from the United States, and I live in California, and I have a cold. <laughs> um, I normally don't sound like this, but um, I'm getting better, so I'm excited to spend today with you guys and to talk about these short stories. So um, if we could just kind of go around the room and have everybody say where they're from, and uh, something about yourself. And we'll start with Miss Cecilia. Yeah, I'm Cecilia. I'm from Uruguay, a small country in South America between Argentina and Brazil. I'm 48. I'm a student teacher. And that's it. I'm in Colingo. Uh, for a month already, and I became a colingua Yeah, <laughs> Nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're here. And Ednardo? Sure. Uh, I am Ednardo Sabino. I'm 23 years old, and I'm married with uh, one of the most beautiful girls in my country. Ah, <laughs> that's wonderful. That's uh, great. So uh, I was kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Don't let your wife hear you say that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm gonna show her for her this video after. All right, very good. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. So and, uh, that's it. Okay, okay very nice. And uh, Federico. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Federico. I'm uh, from Argentina, but currently live in Spain. Uh, nothing, I'm a system engineer, and uh, I really enjoy to participate in the Colingo classes. Awesome, very good. And Luisa? <laughs> My name is Luisa. I'm from Armenia, and I'm a student. That's all. And you're still awake. <laughs> so. 11 p.m. Yeah, just a lot. That's late. That's so late. <laughs> and Firkin from Turkey. <laughs> Actually, I'm from Argentina. No, today you're from Argentina, <laughs> huh? Yeah. Big country between Brazil and. I don't know the other country. <laughs> actually, actually, it's a great country. Yeah, perfect country. <laughs> And uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Firkin, my um, my church is actually going to to Turkey in a couple months. If I wasn't pregnant, I would be joining them. So, um, yeah. So. Which city are you going? I'm sorry. Which city? 
I don't know. I'll, when I find out, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. I think okay. they're going to a few different ones, but yeah, so, but I'll let you know. So, and um, Nikita? Uh, hello, my name is Nikita. I live in the Russian Federation, Northwest Park. We have uh, well, many snow now. I'm 70 years old. Is it cold there? Yeah, very yeah. cold. Yeah. Nice. Welcome to class. Welcome to class. Thank you. And uh, Sidani? Hello, everybody. My name is Sidani. I'm from Algeria. Uh, it's my first class with you, teacher. I'm happy. Very nice. I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. And Sofian. Hi, everybody. My name is Sofian. I'm from Algeria. Ooh, awesome. Very good. So, very good. All right, guys. So, let me, um, let me get up and show this to you. So, we have um, this word, and it's grotesque. And this is going to be, like I said, this is going to be a very important word for our studies um, for the next four classes. And um, it can be used as both as an adjective and a noun. And the way that we're going to be using it is both. So as an adjective, the word grotesque means odd or unnatural in shape, appearance, or character. Um, fantastically ugly or absurd and bizarre okay so as and as a noun if you're describing somebody as grotesque you can be describing an object a design a person or a thing so and some synonyms for you some other words that also um, mean uh, grotesque are distorted deformed um, the one that probably will make the most sense to you in terms of how we're using it is weird, um, antic, and wild. So, um, like I said, we're going to be looking at this a lot um, in the next four classes. Um, I'll give you just kind of a quick background on uh, Winesburg, Ohio. So, um, it was published in 1919. It's very old. It was published in 1919. And it was written by a man named Sherwood Anderson. Um, to be honest, I've never read anything else that Sherwood Anderson has ever written except for Winesburg, Ohio. Um, kind of the idea behind, behind Winesburg, Ohio is it's about um, small town living. Does anybody here live in a small town? Like not a lot of people, very small, kind of everybody knows everybody. I, I do. I live in a small town. I know I live in California, but I do live in a small town. I usually live in a small town. Yeah. 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 So, um, and Federico, Firkin's playing with you. He's from Turkey. He's just playing. So, he's not from Argentina. So, um, but yeah, so it's about small town living. And if any of you have ever lived in a small town, you'll know that. Um, Sometimes it can be kind of a problem when everybody knows everybody. Um, if everybody knows everybody in a town, what can you imagine happens? Everybody knows about each other, about it's, others. Exactly, exactly. Everybody knows about each other. And if you have something going on in your life that you don't want everybody to know about, it's sometimes hard to keep it. From them. Yeah. yeah, so um, that's kind of what uh, Winesburg, Ohio is about. Um, it's kind of in, in between between a novel and a collection of short stories. So um, <laughs> Carlos says small town, big hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it, it, it absolutely can be. So um, that's what we're going to be looking at today. And I will give you um, the link to what we're reading and I'll also yeah gossip is huge gossip is very big in small towns and that's kind of what these stories are about so here's the link to the text um, that we're going to be reading um, mm -hmm. I'll also screen share with you guys as well um, basically we're just gonna get as far as we can each class um, and at the end of class if this really interests you um, 
Fridays, I'm supposed to be teaching a two two hour class for Film and Lit. If this is, if you guys are really into this, I'll go ahead and teach this for two hours on Fridays as well. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it. Um, the main point of this class is for reading comprehension. Um, that's what I really want you guys to get out of it is reading comprehension. So that's what we're going for. Um, we're going to start with the first part of this, um, which is the book of the grotesque. And um, do I have a volunteer who would like to start us off by reading? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Louisa? Okay. All right, Louisa, um, go ahead and go ahead and read those first three paragraphs for me. Okay. The reader, an old man with a white mustache. Uh, mustache. That, yeah, had some difficulty in getting into that. The windows of the house in which he lived were high, and he wanted to look at the trees when he wake in the morning. A carpenter came to fix the bed so that it would be a level with the window. Quite a, a fuss was made about the matter. The carpenter, who had been a so soldier in the Civil War, came into the writer's room and sat down to talk of building a platform of for the purpose of raising the bed. The writer had a uh, cigarette uh, lying about and carpenter smoked. For a time, the two men talked of the rising of the bed and then t they talked of other things. The soldier got, an, got the subject of the war. The writer, in fact, led him to the subject. The carpenter had once been a prisoner in Andersonville prison yeah. and had lost a brother. The brother had died of starvation and whenever the carpenter got upon the subject, he cried. He liked the old writer had the white mustache and when he cried, he puckered um, up his lips and the mustache uh, bobbed bob up and down. The weeping old man with the cigar in, in his mouth was uh, ludic uh, ludicrous. Yeah, good. The plan the writer had for the raising of the dead was forgotten and later the carpenter did it in his own way and the writer who was past 60 had to help himself with a chair when he went to bed at night. Good. <laughs> Yeah, good job. Good, Louisa. Your microphone seems to be working better, too. I can hear you, like, a lot clearer. So that's good. Um, all right, so who um, – we are starting off, and this is kind of the only times we're going to see these characters, but who are the two characters that we're looking at right now? A writer. A writer. A carpenter. And a carpenter. carpenter. And can you describe the writer for me? Can you give me something that you know about him that we've learned? An old man. He's an old man. With a white mustache. White mustache. Uh huh. Yep. How old is he? Past 60. Past 60. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. What else do you know about him? He had some difficulty to get into bed. Uh huh. Why? Because the, the because windows of the house the uh, in which he lived uh, were high. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, he. Those are actually those are two kind of a little bit separate things. Why is the carpenter there? Because he wants to raise his his bed. Yeah. He wants to lift the bed so he can see the windows. Right. He wants yes. to be able to look out of the windows. Mm -hmm. um, and so he has the carpenter there. And um, what was the writer's, what did the writer originally want the carpenter to do to the bed? He wanted him to build what? Uh, he wanted to build a bed higher to he see the trees outside there. Right? There's a name for what he wanted him to build for the bed. Uh.
starts with a P. Platform. A platform. platform. Yes. Yeah, he wanted he wanted the carpenter to build a platform. But the carpenter and the writer start talking and what do they start talking about? The war. Oh. Uh-huh. What what war? Civil, civil war. war. The civil war. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Hey, Christian. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, how are you? Yeah, perfect. How can I start my camera? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will find... Uh, okay. I will All find right. some... Ah, here, here, yeah. Yeah, I found it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> ah, no, Actually, but... Okay. No? Yes, maybe? No worries, no worries. So, it does... You do have some background noise though, Christian, so I'm going to mute you for a second until okay. that goes away, okay? My <laughs> Sorry, no worries, no worries. Just um, keep yourself muted until you want to talk. Or if you have headphones, go ahead and put those on too. So, um, yeah, so they start talking about the Civil War. What are they doing while they're talking? Uh. Yeah, they're smoking. They're smoking. they're smoking. Yeah, they're smoking. And who was in the war? The writer or the carpenter? Carpenter. The carpenter. The carpenter. carpenter. And what do you know about his experience in the war? It was a tough experience. Uh huh. He was a prisoner because he lost a brother. His brother. Yeah, good. Exactly. He was a prisoner, and he lost his brother. brother. Um, where was he a prisoner at? Under. Andersonville. Does anybody know where that's at? No. I've been there. I've actually been there. It's in Georgia. It's in the state of Georgia. Um, yeah. I've. I actually have pictures. I was there when I was. I went there when I was really little. When I was a little tiny girl, and it resembles something like a concentration camp. It was very hard. They starved the soldiers. It was awful. It was terrible. So, um, but yeah, it's in Georgia. So this, they're in Ohio. And this is, you know, they were in Georgia. So this guy obviously has traveled. Um, so since they're talking about the war, does the writer actually get the platform built? No. No. What ends up happening? Because uh, they start to talk. Yeah, they start um. to talk. They begin to talk about the other thing. Uh huh. Yep. Uh, the carpenter uh, do it uh, on his way. Exactly. So the carpenter just—they don't even talk about the plans for the bed. The carpenter just does it his own way, and that's the reason why the writer has such a hard time getting into bed. So good. Um. Carlos, all right, Carlos need it. <laughs> hey, Carlos. So, do I have a volunteer who would like to read um, the rest of this page I for me? Read. Firkin, okay, yes. go. Yeah, okay, Firkin, uh, go ahead and read the rest of this page for me. Okay. In his bed, the writer rolled over on his side and lay quite still. For years, he had been beset with notions concerning his art. He was a hard smoker and his heart fluttered. The idea had got into his mind that he would sometime die unexpectedly, and always when he got into the bed, he thought of that. It did not alarm him. The effect, in fact, was quite a special thing and not easily explained. It made him more alive there in bed than at any other time. Perfectly still, he lay and his body was old and not of much use anymore. But something inside him was altogether young. He was like a pregnant woman, only that thing inside him was not a baby but a yacht. No, it wasn't a yacht. It was a woman, young and wearing a coat of mail like a knight. It is absurd, you see, to try to tell what was inside the old writer as he lay on his high bed and listened to the fluttering of his heart. 
the thing to get at is what the rider or the young thing within the rider was thinking about. The old rider, like all of the people in the world, had got during his long five, five a great I many notions. That's a typo. It's supposed to say life. Five. A great many notions in his head. He had once been quite handsome, and a number of women had been in love with him. And then, of course, he had known people, many people, known them in a peculiarly intimate way that was different from the way in which you and I know people. At, le at least, that is what the writer thought, and the thought pleased him. Why quarrel with an old man concerning his thoughts? Good job, good job for kids. So, um, one thing, um, pronunciation-wise, um, this word that I've highlighted in blue, we pronounce that youth. 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 Huh? youth. Okay. Youth. Yeah, youth. Don't forget the th. Youth. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, youth is like a young person, right? So, if you're full of youth, you're full of of young. Uh, you feel young. So, um, is this writer? Is he healthy? No. 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 Not no. at all. No, what's wrong with him? Not healthy yet. Uh, heart attacks. Yeah, his heart his heart beats really fast, right? Yeah. Um, from what? What's causing his smoking. heart? Smoking. From heart smoking. smoking. A lot of uh -huh. smoke. Yeah, he's yeah he smokes a lot. He's a heavy smoker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but does it bother him? No. No. Why not? Because he feels like a young, a young people. Yeah, he feel it makes him feel young. He it, yeah. this this heart pitter pattering mm. makes him feel like he's young again. Yeah, it has the opposite effect. It can, it can like a young. Yeah, uh, uh, say that. Healthy. Say that again, Sidani. Did you? I did you say something, Sidani? That I yeah, missed? I said uh, conv convince. Yeah, it convinces him. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It convinces him that he that he feels younger. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And what else do we find out about the writer? What about his relationships with people? Does he have good relationships, bad relationships? What's the deal? He used to have a lot of relationships in the past, but now no. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when it says when he was young, what what kind of relationships did he have when he was younger, or who did he have relationships with when he was younger? Many women. women. With a lot of women. Yeah. Exactly. And it also says what? that he was what? Like pregnant woman. In love. Handsome. Man. Yes. Exactly. He was handsome, and because yeah. he was handsome. Or good looking. Charming women. man. Yeah, very charming, exactly. So um, a lot of women fell in love with him. Now, if you look at um, it, also says that he has, that he's known a lot of people and he's known them in a peculiar, peculiar, <laughs> peculiarly intimate way. Now, intimate can mean two different things. There's intimacy like we have between lovers, like between a man and a woman, but that's not what they're talking about here. Think back to what we read about with the carpenter. That's an intimate relationship. So basically the writer is able to get people to talk about things and have this intimate relationship with people that a lot of us can't have with, with just anybody. He's really good at relationships. He's really good at getting people to talk about themselves, exactly, and to tell about their experiences and whatnot. So, uh-huh. Uh, sorry, what is a per particular, per peculiar? Or? Peculiar? It peculiar, means normal. yeah. No, strange. normal. Strange, uh-huh. Strange, uh-huh. Strange, uh-huh. OK, yeah. thank you. Yep, exactly. Yeah, or I meant to ask you guys that. Is there any other vocabulary words in this that we've read so far that you want clarification on? Mm -hmm. 
if I forget to ask you about vocabulary, please stop me and, and ask by all means. So, um, yeah. Query. Um, I don't know its meaning. Um, say that again. Quarrel at the last oh. sentence. Why quarrel? Quarrel. Quarrel would be would be quarrel. arguing. Exactly, it means arguing. Uh huh. Yeah. So they're basically saying, why argue with an old man concerning his thought? So um, you might argue that this guy wasn't good at relationships, but he thinks he's good at relationships. So why bother arguing? Um, sorry, Christian. Um, does anybody live next to or know anybody that's elderly or old? Yes. No. Would you say that they have strong opinions about things? Wise, maybe. Wise, uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I live. The people that live behind me um, are like in their nineties. I mean, they're like. Old. Old. Yeah, <laughs> they're, yeah, they're 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 getting up there, and the the man, the gentleman, he's there's no use in arguing with him about anything. <laughs> Just whatever he thinks, you're like, all right, yeah, Frank, you're that's right. good. Yeah, that, that's good. <laughs> no worries. So, exactly, exactly. So let's um. Let's keep learning about uh, this writer. Um, would somebody else like to read for me? Can I do it? Ednardo? Okay, we'll have Ednardo read. Um, these are. Go to the next page and we'll have you read the next um, four paragraphs because they're short. Okay. In the bed, the writer had a dream that was not a dream. As he grew somewhat sleepy, but was still conscious, he first began to appear before his eyes. He imagined to young, indescribably indescribable thing within himself was driving a long processing of figures before his eyes. You see the interest in all these lies in the figures that went before the eyes of the writer. They were all grotesques. All of the men, all of the men and women the writer had ever known, had become grotesques. The grotesques were not all horrible. Some were amusing, some almost beautiful, and one, a woman, all drowned, out of shape, hurt the old men by her grotesqueness. When she passed, he made a noise like a small dog whimpering. Had you come into the room, you might have supposed to the old man had um, unpleasant dreams or perhaps indigestion. For, for an hour, the procession of grotesques passes before the eyes of the old man, and then Al thought it was a painful thing to do. He crept to out of bed and began to write. Someone, someone of the grotesques had made a deep impression on, on his mind, and he wanted to describe it. Oh, good, very good. All right, so now here we get to um, kind of the weird stuff. <laughs> so, um, so he's describing what? His uh, dreams, or <laughs> his? Yeah. Who is appearing in this dream? Mm, a woman. Some figures. Women. Women and who? Different, there's different people. Yeah, different people. Exactly. And he describes them as how? Grotesque. Some of them grotesque and one of the women not grotesque. Um, actually, she, it's actually that she's, she's um, even more so grotesque. Um, now, this is, where, this is where things can get kind of confusing. 
what he means by grotesque. What do you? Oh, let me ask you this. What do you think he means by calling these people grotesque? What are your thoughts? Weird. Okay. Maybe In what way? Natural. Bizarre. Mm -hmm. Do they look weird? Do they act weird? Um, what makes them grotesque? Mm. Unnatural mm. persons. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Yeah. All of those are th those are all actually really good answers. Um, yeah, the nature of these people, perhaps the way they look, the way they're acting. Um, there's something very unnatural about them. So, um, he doesn't. He, sorry, sorry, Sinead, but he yeah, doesn't no. mention. He doesn't mention the um, the reason why he look. He look in the in these people. Uh, they 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 are all grotesque. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't mention why, does he? Why do you think? Do you have an idea of why? I don't know. Maybe. He 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 doesn't he, he doesn't uh, remember uh, the, the the reason, but uh, my, um, I don't know why. Yeah, no, that's that's really that's a good point. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't really mention why he thinks these people are grotesque, um, but we we're gonna find out. We are gonna find out what makes these what makes these people uh, grotesque. Um, Firkin, what's drawn out of shape? It's um, it means that they're they're distorted, they're they're not uh, they're not perfect. So uh, drawn out of shape, it might mean that maybe she walks weird, or um, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with her for sure. So now, is he disgusted by these people? Go ahead, Cecilia. Go ahead. And maybe he thinks that they are not refined. Okay, so they're not sophisticated enough. Hmm. Not sophisticated enough. Okay, yeah, that's it. That's, that's I don't point. know. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Absolutely, we don't. This we don't really know yet. We really don't. We're we're just learning about this whole idea of of these grotesque people. Um. I, does he find them disgusting though is is to him is is grotesque a bad thing or is it a good thing or how does he feel about these people we don't know he feel amused maybe he feels amused okay yeah. some of them are be were beautiful except for one woman i guess uh-huh uh-huh yeah exactly so it's it's not it's almost like um, well, can you think of any other words that you could dis you could say that how this man feels about these people other than amused or that some of them are beautiful? Can you think of a word? Deep impression, maybe. Yeah, keep going with that. The word I'm thinking of starts with an F. Yeah, with an F. Fancy, no. Fascinating. Yeah, exactly. He's almost fascinated by these people, right? And we don't know why. We have no idea why he's fascinated. That's that's actually to give you kind of a clue. That's what this whole book and all these short stories we're going to find out what what the fascination is with these different uh, grotesque people for sure. Um Federico, do you want to, uh, or before we go on, does anybody have any vocabulary questions or anything they would like to add or any more questions about this? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, oh, how wait, many? Oh, oh. <laughs> Hold on one second, Federico. Go ahead, Ednardo. What was your question? Uh, I'm going to read this little, uh, this little part. When she passed, he made a noise like a small dog whimpering. Uh -huh. Crying. Whimpering is like a small cry, like. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and that's why that's why they said if you walked into the room and you saw this old dude sleeping in his bed, you might think that maybe he had an indigestion, you know, his stomach hurt, or you might think he was having a bad dream. Hmm. So yeah, um, good question. Um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, after the sentence. 
had you come into the room and you might have supposed I don't understand the grammar structure of the sentence it looks like a question but there's no question mark mm, it's it's more like a supposition it's more like a suggestion um, it's kind of like saying um, if you ha you could also say if you had come into the room omitive know? yeah so um, Okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, it's more like you're supposing, you're supposing something. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so a woman all drawn out of shape. It just means that she's distorted. She's there's something. You look at her and you know something's not right with her. You know something's not right. So she might look funny. Maybe her hair is disheveled. Maybe she's really um, emaciated or skinny. Um, Something's not, you know, something's not right with her. So, yeah. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, thank you, Brandon. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, this is the link to what we're reading. And we're on, actually, maybe I should give you the right one. Um, we're on page two. So, um, Federico, go ahead yeah. and finish this page off for us. Okay. Um, at his desk, the writer worked uh, work for an hour. He wrote a book which he called The Book of the Grotesque. It was never published, but I saw it once and it made an incredible impression on my mind. The book had one central thought that is very strange and has always remained with me. By remembering it, I have been able to understand many people and things that I was never able to understand before. The thought was involved, but a simple statement of it would be something like this. That in the beginning, when the world was young, there were a great many thoughts, but no such thing as a truth. Man made the truth himself, and it truth was a composite of a great many vague thoughts all about in the world were the truths and they were all beautiful. The old man has listed hundreds of the truths in his book. I will not try to tell you all of them. There was the truth of virginity and the truth of passion, passion the truth of wealth and of poverty, of thief and of profligacy, of careless, carelessness and abandon. Hundreds of hundreds were the truths and they were all beautiful. And then the people came along. Each, as he appears, snatched up on uh, uh, one of the truths, and some who were quite strong snatched up dozens of them. It was the truth that made the people grotesque. The old man had quite an elaborate theory concerning the matter. It was his notion of, the, of that notion that the moment one of the people took one of the truths of, to himself, called it his truth and tried to live his life by it. He became a grotesque and the truth he embraced became a falsehood. You can see for yourself how the old man who had spent all of his life writing and was filled with words would write hundreds of pages concerning this matter. The subject would become so big and in his mind that he, he himself would be in danger of becoming a grotesque. He didn't, I suppose for the same reason that he never published the book. It was the young thing inside him that saved the old man. Concerning the old carpenter who fixed the bag for the writer, I only mention him because he, like many of what are called very common people, became the nearest things to what is understandable for lovable for all the grotesque in the writer's book. Good. So what makes, according to the writer, what makes a person a grotesque? The truth. The truth. What about what about a truth? What about it? Um, a truth was making he became a uh, grotesque in the composite uh, of loud things. Well, what what exactly? So he says in the beginning there was um. A lot of vague ideas mm -hmm. and those vague ideas became truths and then people came along right mm -hmm. and each person will 
take a truth and make it their own. And then that person starts to live by that truth. Then what happens? It became a vertex. Vertex. Mm -hmm. So basically, what he's saying is that if you take something, if you take a truth, and you hold on to it, and you try to make it your own truth, you become yeah. a grotesque. It dist you're distorting the truth, basically. It's like your neighbor. Yeah, your your neighbor, for example. Is, say that again. No, it's like you told you told us before of your neighbor, the, the, the old man who lived behind of you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So when, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you don't want to argue with a grotesque part because that's their truth, you know. And it's basically he's basically saying, I'm sorry, that's my cat over there. Um, <laughs> he's ba he's basically saying that when you take a truth and you hold on to it and you say that that is your truth, you're actually distorting the truth. That truth is really no longer the truth. Yeah. Does that make it's, sense? It's your version of the truth, but it's, it's not mean that... Uh... Exactly. It's your version of the truth, but that, does that necessarily mean that it is the truth? Not really. no. no, it doesn't. Exactly. So that's what makes a person... Grotesque. It's very, um, I remember when I studied this in college, for a long time we were like, huh? <laughs> so if right now if you're feeling kind of like, huh, don't worry about it. Um, it'll it'll come, it, the more you look at it, it, the more it'll make sense to you. So, um, but yeah, exactly. So, um, do you agree? Do you agree with the writer? Do you think... Do you think his his theory on what makes a person grotesque is is true? Is it a truth? Uh, mm, maybe. Oh. More or less. More or less. More or less. Okay. Yeah. If you if you have a truth and you hold on to it for a long time, mm -hmm. and then maybe something happens. Or someone comes along and suggests something different, and you reject what they're saying. Can you think of a word that we would, a different phrase that we would use to describe? Um, can you think of a different? Can you think of a different um, phrase that we would maybe a more common word? that we would use to describe a person like that other than grotesque? Uh, pain or pain. Say that again? Stubborn, maybe. Stubborn? Banal? I'm thinking of something that it's a two-word phrase and it starts with a C. The first word starts with a C and the second starts with an M. Mind the Close minded. Yeah, exactly. Close minded. Close minded. Exactly. Good. Um, let's. Does anybody have any more questions regarding this? Yes, teacher. Sure, please. Absolutely. What does it mean, flash hood? Say that again. Flash. Flash hood. Falsehood, maybe. Falsehood. Oh, falsehood. Falsehood. Uh-huh. Um, let me, where is, uh, I'm on the wrong page. Hold on one second. A falsehood is a lie. Yeah. Falsehood. 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 falsehood is a lie, basically. So, bas uh, like we were talking about, he became a grotesque, and the truth he embraced became a falsehood. So, even if you know that the truth you're holding on to isn't mm -hmm. true, it's a falsehood, so it's not. It's a lie. It's a lie. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So no problem. No problem. So, um, my cat's trying to make an appearance in class. <laughs> he wants to participate. She does. <laughs> ah, she. Sorry. Yeah. It's just, 
Hello, hey, Cap. Hi, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> She's so bad. I changed it. Seriously. Um, <laughs> Uh, profligacy, it basically means um, superfluous or something like it's the opposite of being um, careful with your with like with your money or being it's your um, your I'm trying to think of a, a different word um, it's, uh, it's And it's totally escaping me, the word I'm thinking of. It's, like, right on the tip of my tongue. It's when you, you're you not careful with your money. You just – you spend whatever. You do whatever. Um, you're not careful about anything. You have – you know, if you're thrifty, that means that you try to be careful with what you have. If you're um, – if you are a profligate person, that means that you're not. You're not careful with what you have. You just do whatever. Yes. You waste, you waste uh, without yeah. considering anything. Yeah, exactly. You're a waster. Yeah. You're a waster. <laughs> You're a waster. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I have a good question. What is sure. snatch up? Snatch up means to yeah. grab up. So oh, like, okay. yeah. So like, if something is like laying down and you grab it real quick, you're snatching it up. Uh huh. Yeah. It's a quick motion of grabbing. Uh huh. Any more questions? No. Do you find this fascinating at all? I find it weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grotesque. <laughs> <laughs> it is weird. It is weird. So, um, let's um, let's see. We, I have quite a few newcomers. Is it? Co oh, let's see. Um, all right. Let's. I want to start the next part of this and actually get into the stories possibly, but let's talk about this a little bit more. So the writer, he, he saw this dream and all these people, um, oh my cat, uh, he saw all these people in his dream, all these grotesque people going before him. And what was he compelled to do? What did he do after that? Right. Uh huh? What's the book that he ended up writing called? Um, the Book of uh, the Grotesque. Yeah, The Book of the Grotesque. Was it ever published? No. 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 Um, so we have this narrator, though, who <laughs> was, <laughs> was able to uh, to see this book and... And he read about it, and he gives us kind of a synopsis of what uh, the writer's idea was about grotesqueness and truth. Um, a little bit of trivia for you. This book, Winesburg, Ohio, the original title was The Book of the Grotesque. That was the original title. I have a, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, the writer said that he was able to understand uh, many people and things that he never, he never able to understand before. Uh, but I cannot understand <laughs> why. Why? What okay. happened? What happened to to? Uh, become understandable people who don't understand before. Okay, so um, basically, okay, so the, the sentence that, that Ednardo is referring to is, by remembering it, it being the book, uh, by remembering it, I have been able to understand many people and things that I was never able to understand before. So what he's basically saying What he's saying is that before he read this book, perhaps he came across people, situations, experiences that he walked away from and kind of thought, I don't get that. But after reading this old man's book, The Book of the Grotesque, he could look back and be like, that's what that meant. That's what that person, you know, that's what that person was all about. Or that's what that situation was all about. 
he's basically saying that this book that he read enlightened him to things that he wasn't able to understand before. So, uh, go ahead. So he he founded these answers in in the book in the books or in, in inside the dream. I. I Okay, we're talking. Okay, that's I, I see what you're saying. We're actually talking about two different people here. So the person that is the narrator of what we're reading is not the old man. It's an unnamed narrator that we have no idea who it is. It could be anybody. It could be me. It could be you. It could be whoever. <laughs> so this unnamed narrator is the one who's telling us about the old man and the old man's book. So somehow this um, narrator somehow came across this old man and his book and um, read it and life, life so to speak, was kind of clarified for him. Now, once we start getting into this, there's a character who we'll read about that this narrator could very possibly be, and we'll get we'll get there. So, but these are actually two different people, like I said. So we have the old man who actually wrote the book of the grotesque, and we have the narrator who's telling us about the old man and the but book. But narrator the doesn't know anybody about anything about the book, about the grotesque book. Uh, say that again, Nardo. Who he knows. Uh, I'm asking if the narrator uh, knew about something about the grotesque book or no. Yes, he did. He, what, well, I'm not sure if I'm understanding right. What, do you mean, like, did he know about the, the, did he know the actual people in the book? No, what, no? what's inside the book was. Uh, yeah, he knows. Yes, the narrator knows what's inside the book. Yeah, he knows. He knows. Go ahead, Cecilia. But isn't it autobiographical? I mean, isn't it the voice of the narrator uh, and the writer, the, the parole, the same person? No, no, no. The narrator is not the writer. Yeah, the narrator is not the writer. What what kind of throws you, I think what's kind of thrown you guys for a loop is that um, we've been reading about the writer and all of a sudden we are thrown in to somebody saying I. You know, so we um, we've been reading about this writer and then um, here, let me screen share with you guys real quick. Okay. So we have, um, we have this narrator who's talking to us, you know, to the audience, and he's telling us about the writer, and he's saying, this is where I think you guys are, are getting a little uh, confused. At his desk, the writer worked for an hour. In the end, he wrote a book which he called the Book of the Grotesque. It was never published, but I saw it once, and it made an indelible impression on my mind. Yeah, because so, he read it. Exactly, he read it, but he's not the one who wrote it. Who wrote he's it. He's not the one who wrote it, exactly. We don't know how he read it. We don't know how he knows the writer, how he got his hands on the book. We have no idea. Um, we just have to assume that what this guy is yeah I mean Firkin maybe he's the son who knows um, like I said we'll actually end up meeting a character in Winesburg Ohio that I personally think is the, is the narrator of this mm -hmm. particular point um, we'll meet him I don't know if we'll meet him next time but um, he's a central figure out of all these short stories and that's who I personally think is the, the I, the, the I who read the book. But I don't know. The other thing that you can kind of guess from this is that's kind of weird 
is that because people are like, well, everything that comes out of this basic introduction, people assume is the book of the grotesque. They assume that what we're basically what we're going to read. Um, Victor, hablo espanol más o menos, pero solamente inglés en la clase. So, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I don't speak it very well, either, anyways. So, good Spanish. No. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. So the th the other thing that we can kind of suppose from this is that um, what we're going to read in the future is what the old man wrote. However, what does the narrator tell us about the book? Uh, it was never never published. Yeah, he says it was never published. So but he saw sometime. He he read the book the book sometime before. Right, and at that point, you can assume that it was the original manuscript that he read. So yeah, it's this this whole thing kind of throws your whole mind for like a crazy loop. So go ahead, <laughs> Cecilia. The, so there must be some secret. Uh, I don't know if treat or communication among the writer and the main character, no? Yes, yes, I, yes. I, I think okay. Um, if I'm, I think I get what you're saying. So the the writer, you're talking about the old man, right? That writer. Yeah, the the old man is writing about people that he knows. Yeah, exactly. Yep, exactly, exactly. Yep, that's right. Yep, yep. So, do you guys like this? Yes. yes. Sure. <laughs> okay. Kind of an odd story. Yeah. yeah, it is, and it gets weirder. It gets even weirder. <laughs> so, um, it, we won't. To to be clear, though, we will not encounter the old man again. Um, the old man's done. This is this is it for the old man. So now we're like Cecilia mentioned. Now we're going to start reading about all these grotesques, all these people that paraded in front of this old man in his dream. That's what we're going to read about from now on. Alice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. So um would you like to do two hours of this on Friday? I can tell Juliana it's not a problem. Yes. yes. For me yeah? to be okay. All right. <laughs> I can't do two hours today, but we will do two hours on Friday. I'll let Juliana know. We'll begin so. the same time. Yep, same time. Yep, same time. Um, we'll do two hours, like I said. We'll have like a five-minute break because the way that uh, the Google...